has been mostly centered in Jerusalem, the, the head church, the mother church. As I was preparing, it reminded me a little bit of Lighthouse and then the outreach of Lighthouse, specifically in the Philippines, but even in China as well. Uh, Jerusalem was the hub and the center of all the activity, but things are beginning to change now. And as we're going to see today, already the gospel is spreading out, and we're going to see today very, very firmly the gospel beginning, the center of, of activity beginning to shift from Jerusalem, which was a Jewish church, pretty much 100% a Jewish church, to a non-Jewish church, or in Bible terms, we'd say a Gentile church, and today we're going to see the rise of a church in Antioch of Syria. Antioch of Syria. And this baby church, this offspring church of the main church is going to become the center and the focus of activity. Um, Jerusalem's going to continue, but there's going to be a lot of activity and a lot of things going on outside of Jerusalem now. And this reminds me a little bit of what we see in Lighthouse, and then we look at what's happening with the churches in the Philippines. These churches were established out of Lighthouse. The missionaries of the, and the pastors of these churches came from Lighthouse. Lighthouse has supported, they got their training here, but God's message spread as it did in the New Testament and as it does here. This is how God works. This is always how God works. And it should be a good thing and not a bad thing when we see God's word and God's work spread. That should always be a good thing. And so that's what we're going to see very much today. Most of you have your, um, have your books if you've been saving this and you've been keeping it. And you're going to see now, since the action is shifting, since the action is changing, you're going to find very useful now what was in the early pages of your notebook. You have a map in your notebook, and now's the time to start using it. If you say, I have no idea where my notebook is, go digging and look for it, okay? And we've given you a map because you're going to start coming across all of these place names. Well, where is Phoenicia? Well, where is Cyrene? Well, where is, where's Antioch of Syria? All of these places are on the map. And instead of just sort of glazing over these places, take time to find them on the map, and it will make... Um, it will make what happens in the book of Acts much more vivid and much more real to you. Okay? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. So last week um, we, we finished up with chapter 11 as Peter had to explain himself to the church in Jerusalem. And then he, uh, it, was, it took place in Caesarea. Peter preached to a group of Gentiles that were gathered. God showed that he accepted their sincere hearts in response to him by immediately, dramatically, and miraculously pouring out the Holy Spirit on them. And it was a reminder to me, and it should be a reminder to us, that what God accepts, we must also accept, brothers and sisters, right? If God says yes, we can't say no. If God says yes, we echo yes, yes, and then we keep in step with God. We talked about uh, how to interpret and understand things that happen to us or sometimes dreams or things like that, and I gave you some Bible examples last week. Do you remember those? And those are in your notes as well. I want to show you one specific thing from what Peter says that will help, um, that will help remind you of how the Holy Spirit works. Whoops. Let's see. I'm responsible for the clicker. <laughs> so it's a tale of two churches. Those of you that know British literature will know, oh, yes, a tale of two cities, but it's a tale of two churches and one man, because we're going to talk about Barnabas this morning as well. And I want you to look with me as we, then we're going to move quickly on, because I want us to see this this morning, not just this is something that happened a long time ago, but there's some great lessons for us in this, in this portion um, of Acts that will help us as Christians as well this morning. Remember what Peter said as he is giving his defense? He says, as I began to speak, 
the Holy Spirit came down on them, these non-Jews, these Gentiles, just as on us at the beginning, look at verse 16, then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now remember what I said last week? In everything in our Christian lives, the word of God is our standard, right? It must be. If you have an experience and it doesn't measure up to the word of God, set it aside. If you have a dream that feels like it's from God, but it doesn't measure up with the word of God, you set it aside. If somebody comes to you even with signs and wonders and it doesn't measure up to the word of God, you set it aside. God has given us his word to guide us, to keep us safe, to keep us going in the right direction. And not only has he given us his word, he has put the Holy Spirit, God himself, in us to make things clear to us, to help us understand and interpret his word. And so when Peter says this, he says, then I remembered the word of the Lord. Peter says he remembered, and this is a special word, and I want you to look at one other scripture. Look with me, go all the way back to John 14, 26, at what Jesus says just before he goes to the cross, before he's crucified, and he tells them, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. They didn't really understand, but they were going to understand. And he told them one of the job responsibilities of the Holy Spirit. What is the job responsibility? But the counselor or the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your, what? Remembrance, all that I have said to you. Here is, here is a perfect display of what the Holy Spirit, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does when he comes. It is the Holy Spirit's job to remind us of the word of the Lord. And that's what he does for Peter, doesn't he? Specifically, in this situation, here is this Bible. I, well, I've got my Bible this morning on my phone, so I could wave it around, but it doesn't look so dramatic. I should have a, a big Bible that's really thick with all the big pages. Here's this Bible, God's word. And you and I read the word of God, but it's a big book. There's a lot there. How are we going to remember it all? How are you and I going to know what is applicable to our situations and to our lives? We're in a crunch time. Something happens. Something's going on. And we're there. And we're in the situation. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit, our helper, God himself at that moment whispers to you from the Word of God and reminds you of the Word of God and you're able to stand. You're able to keep on going. You're able to be, you are strengthened. You're encouraged or maybe corrected. Have you ever started to go down a path or have you ever started to do something and you felt a correction in your heart or in your spirit and you don't go that way. Don't do that. That was the Holy Spirit. And maybe he brought a scripture to mind. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And we see this beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit, who is God, reminding Peter of the word of God, Jesus. Because at that time, it was still, that was before the New Testament had been written. Um, we had the Old Testament. But the words of Jesus and the Holy Spirit does his job. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that encouraging? What's our responsibility, brothers and sisters? Can you and I sit here and just say, whew, let me sip a pina colada or something under, uh, under a palm tree and let the Holy Spirit do his work? We have a responsibility too. And our responsibility is to take in the word of God on a regular basis. Feed on the word of God. And then, at the moment of need, the Holy Spirit will remind you of what you have taken into your life. And we, keep up, we could keep on going down that road, but we got to keep on going because I'm looking at the time and we do want to get to some other things this morning. So we see this, and now we get back to the Jerusalem church, who is Jerusalem's the head church, the mother church, the first church in a way, in very much the same way that Lighthouse is the mother church. And then in the Philippines, for example, let's make it real this morning, uh, the first church 
was I'm trying to think which was the first church maybe pastor lorena or mayette and, and yeah and, and some other ones that, are, that aren't doing whatever but maybe lorena pastor mayette and then others and then the most recent one is sister edith now right that it, so we see this picture but jerusalem was the center Jerusalem was the head, and keep in mind that most of these events were taking place in quite a short time frame, okay? The persecution of, of, uh, of Christians begin, begins when Stephen is martyred, Saul is standing there giving his approval, and remember what happens? The great persecution breaks out, and the believers are what? What's that word? Scattered, right? Specifically, they're spread out, they're scattered, and the word is the same as a farmer taking seed and spreading it like that, which is a great, great word that the Holy Spirit inspired to be used because it describes what happened as the believers scattered, but the word of God took root as they went and brought forth fruit. So what of those who are scattered? Peter goes to Samaria. Then he goes to the desert road in his encounter with the Ethiopian eunuchs. Peter, uh, sorry, Philip, thank you. You can correct me. That was false doctrine. Peter did, not, Peter did not go to Samaria first. Philip went to Samaria first. And then later on the road with the Ethiopian eunuch. And then uh, later on, then Peter begins to go up uh, and, and go along the, the coastal cities, visiting the cities where Philip doubtless had preached the gospel. He's evangelizing. He's in Joppa. Then he goes to Caesarea, and that's where uh, he preaches to Cornelius. And it's very, very dramatic. But what else? What about the others? Philip is a bigger name. Peter's a really big name. But then there are nameless believers who are scattered. And what does it say? Meanwhile, while all of this is going on, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as, what's this place? Phoenicia. You got your maps? No. Okay. Uh, don't worry, I included a map for us this morning. Okay. Where is Phoenicia? If you look, uh, I can't do two things. I can't use two tech things at one time, so I'm going to step over here. And today, Phoenicia is where Lebanon, where Lebanon is. It's modern-day Lebanon, okay? Ah, oh. <laughs> folks, that's why you want to get Bible maps. Or else it's kind of dry and dusty, and you, you read these names, you kind of think, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. These are real places and real people. So it's where, it's where modern-day Lebanon is. Where else? Cyprus, okay? Uh, Cyprus is still Cyprus today. Uh, where's Cyprus? There's the island. So here's Jerusalem, right down here. They started traveling where? The area of Phoenicia, Cyprus. Cyprus was an easy one because it was a boat trip. And then where else? And where? And what's the other place? Antioch of Syria. Where's Antioch of Syria? Ah, here we go. Why do they say Antioch of Syria? There are two Antiochs. But this is the this is the most important one. This is where a lot of the action. Where is it today? It's on the border of Syria and Turkey. It's still there today. It's, it's, very small. it's a very small town now, uh, just a few thousand inhabitants or what, a few in, in that area. But at that time, Antioch of Syria was maybe the third most important city in the whole Roman Empire. Very, very important. And it was on a trade route. Uh, it was on the, uh, uh, it was part of the spice trade. It was part of the Roman road. It was part of the silk road that went all the way into, uh, all the way into China. It was part of that. So there was a lot of trade. It was a cosmopolitan city. It was an international city. There were a lot of things going on. And so the believers start traveling to these places. So they're scattered to these, pl these places. And what do they do as they're scattered? They keep preaching the word. They're not, they're not apostles like Peter or not even like Philip, but they're true Christians, and by their lives, they're living as Christians and they're telling people about Jesus, which is what you and I do as well, right? So they keep on going. What do they do as they go? They're preaching the good news. And I want us to see something this morning because we have the dramatic story of Peter 
and Cornelius preaching, uh, being preached to the Gentiles. Really dramatic. Dreams, visions, an angel, a miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Incredibly dramatic. But that's not the only miraculous thing happening. Equally miraculous, but looking much more natural, is what begins to happen next. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch, right over here, who were from Cyprus, yep, and Cyrene, uh, uh, another place name. Where's Cyrene? Right down here. What is this continent? This is the, which continent? It's the African continent, and it is modern day Libya. It's in Libya, okay? So there were Christians from Cyrene and Cyprus that are also traveling, and they get as far as Antioch. Ah, you see? The Bible's interesting, isn't it? Uh-huh. Okay. It's, you're right. They began preaching to what? The Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. Folks, this is a big one. This is a big thing. They're going, and they stop preaching, not stop preaching, but in addition to preaching to, to Jews, they start preaching to Gentiles as well. There's no, is there any dream? No. Is there any vision? No. They just begin preaching. But remember the words of Jesus. You will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and uttermost parts of the earth. Uttermost parts of the earth. Then go back for That's Acts 1.8. You go back to Matthew, and that, that's the great promise. Then you go back to Matthew and the Great Commission. What was the Great Commission? Go into where? All the world. All the world. All the world. We talked last week about blind spots, didn't we? We have these blind spots. This is how it must be. And God sometimes has to do a dramatic work to help us see we've got a blind spot and then to go beyond. But these believers, ordinary people like you and me, are involved in something as dramatic and miraculous as Peter was when he spoke to Cornelius and the, and the Gentiles who were gathered in his house. So they began preaching to Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. No obstacles no hindrances. What happens? The power of the Lord was with them and a large number of Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, as I was studying and preparing, I looked at that phrase and the power of the Lord was with them. Depending on your translation, it may say the hand of the Lord, but it means the same thing. It's, it's the same meaning. It means the power, the the presence and the power of the Lord in, uh, in an active way was with them and a large number of these Gentiles believed. When the power of the Lord is with us as we serve Him, as we work for Him, things will happen. We can get so involved, we can get so busy with all sorts of activities, but unless the hand of the Lord is upon us, nothing happens. Nothing changes. People are not set free. People are not turned to God. People are not released from bondage. Nothing happens unless the hand of the Lord is upon us. Oh, we long for that. We must have that. Let us never get to the place where we are satisfied with busy work for God. I'm doing things for God. I'm doing things for God. But there is no result. There is not the manifestation. There is not the power of God upon our work, upon our lives, that there might be the fruit that comes from such power. We must have the hand of the Lord upon us. Amen. Amen. Don't be satisfied with less. Don't be satisfied with less. Because when the power of the Lord is with us, things happen. Things happen. And a large number of the Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this is more miraculous. Now, these are just a couple of verses. Cornelius and Peter got two chapters for their story. 
Here's something even more dramatic, far greater number, just a few verses, just a few verses. Nevertheless, the hand of the Lord, the work of the Lord. Now, what happens next? Of course, the church in Jerusalem hears about it. Of course they do. There was a lot of activity. There was a lot of communication. Um, the roads between Antioch and Jerusalem, it, they were good roads, the road, easy to travel. And so, of course, very, very soon, the mother church heard about what was happening in Antioch of Syria. But praise the Lord, they had learned their lesson, right? They had learned that what God accepts, they would also accept. They had learned, wow, to put it in modern terms, God loves them as much as he loves me. Now that's a revelation for us sometimes, isn't it? We sometimes come across, how shall I put it, not nice people. Have you ever come across not nice people? And you have feelings in your heart towards them, about them, against them. We all do. We all struggle with that. And then the Holy Spirit works in our hearts gently and revelation comes and it really is revelation <gasps> oh God you love him you love her as much as you love me and it's a good reminder for us that's kind of how this was but the Jerusalem church had learned and so they decided they would support the work of God that was taking place in Antioch of Syria now, we already know what happens, but I have a question for you. Remove this from your memory. and they, uh, Remove this from your eyesight. And they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. Remember, this is the Jerusalem church. Who is the natural choice to be sent to Antioch? Who? Exactly. Peter's the natural choice. He's one of the big leaders, kind of the big leader. Not only that, he had already preached to Gentiles, right? He has experience. Who should go? Peter should go. But Peter doesn't go. Instead, the church wisely and very spiritually sends someone else that we haven't heard about since chapter 4. We only read a couple of verses about this man. And they send Barnabas to Antioch. Why do they send Barnabas? Barnabas. Why is Barnabas the choice? Why is Barnabas God's choice? Well, let's look at some things. Barnabas was Greek speaking, okay? Remember, if you go all the way back to chapter 4, and we'll, we'll, we may mention that, we'll look at it, we'll see. <laughs> okay, we'll see how it goes as we go along. Barnabas is Greek speaking. What else? He's a native of Cyprus. Ah, now, who were the people, who were some of the people who preached the gospel in Antioch? Natives of Cyprus, remember? From Cyprus and Cyrene. So there's a natural connection there. What else? He has a Greek cultural background because he's from Cyprus. Cyprus. He doesn't have a strong Jewish traditional background. He has a Greek background and he's Greek speaking. Okay, these are practical considerations for sending Barnabas. What else? He's an early Jewish convert to Christianity as well. So I would say he's probably, we would count him a mature believer, okay? So here are some practical, here's some practical things. Here's one more practical thing. His insight is respected. You say, Pastor Jennifer, you are reading into the Bible. How do you know that? I know that because in Acts chapter 9, when zealous hothead Saul, who was now a Christian, came to Jerusalem and wanted to join the Christians, the Christians like, no, 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 maybe he's a fake Christian. Maybe he's, he's, still gonna, he's going to get us. He's not real. And Barnabas went to him, listened to his testimony, and then brought Saul to the Christian leaders in Jerusalem, and they accepted his testimony and his insight into this young man. So his in insight is respected. So here are some things about Barnabas that make him a good choice. But brothers and sisters, these are practical considerations, okay? So I know we're not going to get finished this morning, but stay with me for the, for the time that we have remaining. And I want us to see something as we go at least partway here this morning. Here are practical things. When we are making decisions for God's work and in doing God th God's things, practical considerations are part of it, aren't they? 
It should be. They're practical things. But there is more than that because, uh, let's look at this. Here's some other, here's some other um, uh, things for us to look at. There must be more when we're working for God. Now, this looks a little bit funny. You say, Pastor Jennifer, did you get it the wrong way? No, nope, got it the right way. When it is God's work, when it is God's, when it's service for God, it is too important to leave it to merely practical consideration because God's work and service for God is spiritual. And if we rely only on the practical, we will get into trouble. We will. We'll get into trouble. So you look at the practical, but there has to be more than the practical. And this is what I want us to look at. So here are some spiritual considerations. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is the first time we meet this guy, Barnabas, okay? And we learn something about Barnabas here early on, something spiritual about Barnabas. What do we see about Barnabas? What we see about Barnabas is he is part of the work of God in the church. The believers were united in heart and mind. Okay, what's the practical expression of believers being united in heart and mind? When there is a need, corporately they meet the need. Here is an example, a practical example of unity in action. We talk about unity. We preach about unity. We say there must be unity. But unity has feet. Unity has hands. Unity has to show itself. It's not just words. Yes, yes, yes. Unity, there must be, it must go, it must be put into action. And we see in Barnabas the spirit of unity, the spirit of unity that is put into action. He does something about it. He does something about it. Brothers and sisters, in God's church, in Lighthouse, which is God's church, which is God's church, we all do things, we think things, we say things, we have attitudes, all sorts of things. May I give you a filter to evaluate yourself? May I give you a filter? The filter of unity. The filter of unity. What I'm saying is it promoting unity because that, that's what God wants in his church. And that's the picture, that's the perfect picture of his church. What I'm doing, my attitudes, my actions, all of these things, is it promoting harmony in the church of God. Barnabas gives us a picture of practical workings of unity in the church. And so there's a spiritual consideration. Why is this so important in this particular situation? It's important because the church in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch were completely different, completely different. Gentiles and Jews, Jewish culture, Greek culture, Jewish, uh, uh, Hebrew speaking, Greek speaking, all sorts of other things as well, all sorts of other things. It was going to take somebody who had a heart of unity a heart of unity, a practical expression of unity. And so we see this in Barnabas. There had to be. And I want you to see something else as well. He was generous and he was sacrificial. The heart of God at work in you and me will express itself in generosity. Never, ever, ever say, I'm too poor and I don't have enough. I can't. When God is at work in us, he will multiply what we have that it might bless others. If you and I look only, I have five loaves, I have two fish. Can't feed Letty and me both with that for lunch. Sorry, Letty, I'm keeping my five loaves and my two fish for myself. We will remain limited. But when we take what we have, and this is just a practical example, and we say, here, God, I don't have a lot, but I'll share what I have a little bit. What does God do? God feeds me. God feeds Letty. And God feeds a whole bunch of other people as well. 
God blesses me, God blesses Letty, and God blesses others. This is the heart of generosity and sacrificial living and giving in the church of God. So there's this unity, this spirit of unity, and there's also this spirit of generosity and, and sacrificial generosity as well. Does that make sense to us this morning? I, it's the heart of God. It's the heart of God. And, and if we don't have this heart, if we don't have this heart, then we need to get together with God. I really mean it. We need to get together with God and say, God, change my heart. I am this way, and I don't want to be this way. Honestly, how many of us, when we feel like we don't have enough, our natural tendency is to hold on tight, isn't it? It's, it's to hold on tightly. Let God change your heart and open your hands. And we see this in Barnabas. And we, we're coming to a place where we have to stop. There's more we're going to pick up from here. But what I want to say to you is this. We look at the practical considerations for Barnabas to go to Antioch. But the most important considerations for Barnabas to go to Antioch and support and encourage this new church, they were not practical. They were spiritual. They were spiritual. And we see parts of it here. But it's time to come to a, a stop. There's more. May I give you, let me give you just a couple other things, then we're going to stop. You say, you're going to keep on preaching? No, welcome. Well, yes, one or two more minutes. He was generous and sacrificial. He had a spirit of unity. And then if you go there, it says, for he was a good man. Oh, there's another one. Full of the Holy Spirit. Another one. And of faith. So when we come back next time, we're going to talk about character. That's that one. We're going to talk about full of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Does it mean five years ago uh, I spoke in tongues for two minutes one time? That is not what it means. It's not what it means. It means something else. And of faith. How many of you want to be a person who's full of faith? Oh, I do. When I'm around people who are full of faith people, I'm so encouraged. I'm so challenged. How do we become people like that? Is it just some people are that way and some people aren't? Nope. The Bible tells us how we can be people who are full of faith. The Bible shows us how we can be people who are full of the Holy Spirit. The Bible shows us how we can have excellent character. And the one other thing that we'll get to next time. See, I'm giving you, this is the preview for what comes next. His God-given gift the most important of all. And you say Barnabas was special. He had a special gift. Guess what? You have a special gift. You say, I don't feel like it. I don't care if you feel like it or not. God's not a liar. You, if you are a Christian this morning, have at least one God-given gift that he has put in you for you to use to help others. God did that. I didn't do it. You weren't born with it. You didn't earn it. We don't earn gifts. And when we come back next time, we're going to focus on these spiritual qualifications that Barnabas has that qualifies him for this special work of God and how we too should have the same qualifications and how we too can be prepared for the good work of God whenever the opportunity arises. Amen? Amen. So keep your notes with you. God bless you. I'm going to close in prayer. I think I did quite well. <laughs>